Hello, today we are talking about um, regulations and laws that concern um, biodiversity loss. And um, so our goals for this video are that um, by the end of it you will be able to state the main purpose of U.S. and international laws and regulations that are used to protect species. Um, and then during class, we will get into evaluating the effectiveness of these policies. All right, so let's get started. Um, we're going to listen to Ms. Reed tell us about the Endangered Species Act. In 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed, and in it they said they wanted to protect and recover species that were at risk of becoming endangered, as well as the environments that they're dependent on. So in the... In Endangered Species Act, or ESA, species are listed depending on, on how at risk they are of extinction. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service are the government agencies in the U.S. that are in charge of this act. So if you go to their website, or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website, you can actually look at the endangered species in North Carolina. Now these species that they list include both plants and animals. And some of the ones in North Carolina we can see are uh, the red wolf, there are several bats that are listed as endangered. You can see over here there's an E for endangered and a T for threatened. Here's the difference between endangered and threatened. Now a threatened species is just at risk of becoming endangered. What endangered means is a species that it's, is at risk of extinction in a significant portion or all of its range. Now these agencies work hard uh, to protect these threatened and endangered species, and it's part of the act. So it's against the law to take a threatened or endangered species without a permit. And taking actually includes a lot of different means, things. So taking, in this sense, means you cannot harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect an endangered or threatened species. Now, uh, pursue is an interesting one because it includes, uh, it means chasing that might interfere with their survival or reproduction. So, for example, a whale watching boat couldn't pursue uh, certain types of whales that would be listed as endangered because it might interfere with their regular normal behaviors. There's also recovery plans um, that are going to describe the steps needed to restore these species. So we have an action plan to try to prevent these species from going all the way extinct. Um, several species sometimes come off the uh, endangered list and go down to the threatened list. Others get off the list entirely. So that's always great when that happens. So a lot of this involves habitat conservation um, because we want to make sure these organisms have access to the habitats that they need. And so these habitat conservation plans assess impacts on the species due to changes in habitat, and they're going to outline steps uh, to mitigate the impacts. So thinking of development, if we're going to build a new area over here, what is that going to do to the organisms in the area? Is that going to impact any of the endangered species that we're looking out for? More than 1,300 species of plants and animals are listed as endangered or threatened in the United States. Um, another act that was created actually before the Endangered Species Act to protect a specific group of animals is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It was enacted in 1972. It prohibits the taking of marine mammals in U.S. waters and by U.S. citizens on the high seas. So um, in U.S. waters is about... Um, two miles off of our coast. That's our exclusive economic zone. And um, so that's where the extent of U.S. law stops. Um, and then after that, it becomes international waters or the high seas um, where international law applies. But your country's law can still apply to you. Um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act also prohibits the importation of marine mammal marine mammals and marine mammal products into the U.S. So if you wanted to buy a can of whale blubber from Japan or Norway, um, that would be illegal for you to do because you are a United States citizen. This was enacted in 1972. Um, it is managed by the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, okay, and so then we, there are several other um, laws that affect uh, species protection in the United States, um, and here is a list of them. 
All right, so let's move on to international laws. So law is a little bit of an interesting word to use in the international situation. Um, these are usually treaties or agreements between countries and they're usually done through the UN. They're usually referred to as convention on something or another. Um, and it's up to the countries who ratify them to enforce them. And if you don't ratify it, you don't have to enforce it. Um, and also, if you choose to enforce it, you can choose to enforce whatever parts of this treaty or convention that you would like to as a country. Um, so, and in true international cases, like when you have citizens from other countries breaking these laws in a country that they're not from, um, or you have two countries th is claiming that one is violating the treaty, um, it's really difficult to bring it to law because um, both parties have to agree to try the case in an international court. Um, and so if one country says, I didn't do it, I'm not going to court, you can't do anything about it, really. Um, all right, so the first of our two treaty, the two treaties that we're going to talk, or three treaties, sorry, the three treaties that we are going to talk about the first one is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Uh, for short, we refer to it as CITES, C-I-T-E-S. Um, this bans hunting, capturing, selling, or selling threatened or endangered species. It restricts international trade on species or products derived from species that are determined to be endangered or threatened. Um, and enforcement varies from country to country. There are some member countries who have ratified the treaty and um, they are allowed to exempt themselves from protecting a listed species um, because it's a really economically profitable commodity um, because it's so rare. So, I mean, if you um, look at a supply and demand curve, as supply goes down, demand goes up and the price goes up. Um, and, yeah, but it has had a pretty um, significant impact in preventing the trade and the taking of um, endangered and threatened species. Then there is the Convention on Biological Diversity, or the Convention on Biodiversity, depending on what you want to say. Um, it has three goals. The first goal is to conserve biological diversity, or biodiversity. Um, the second goal is to have sustainable use of biodiversity's components. The third goal is um, to have fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from genetic resources. In other words, they want to develop national strategies for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Um, the United States has still not ratified this. Um, and I'll post a document on Moodle from the Defenders of Wildlife um, that put, points out some interesting uh, things. Um, and then we have the International Whaling Commission, um, which is set up in the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling. The intention of this commission is to conserve whale stocks and develop the whaling industry in an orderly fashion. Um, the duty of this commission that they were charged with is to review and revise the measures agreed upon to govern the conduct of whaling throughout the world. Um, so the, the main piece of this and the contra controversial piece of this, um, there was a moratorium placed on all commercial whaling in 1982. So you can, so no country who has, um, ratified this can uh, whale for economic benefit. Um, Japan, Iceland, and Norway have found loopholes and they still whale. Um, it does allow Aboriginal groups to hunt whales for subsistence. So if you so if there is a tribe of people in Alaska um, who has traditionally hunted whales and eaten the products of the whales um, to live off of, then that is still allowed. But they cannot sell these products. They can only use it for subsistence. Um, 
So there is a provision for scientific permits in the IWC uh, that can be issued for research. And that's the loophole that J Japan exploits. Um, and they continue to whale, and most of the world is convinced that it's just a cover for ongoing commercial whaling. And um, Norway and Iceland object to the moratorium, and that's the thing with a lot of international treaties. If you object, then you don't necessarily have to follow the rules of the treaty. You can set your own rules um, if you object, and that's written into a lot of these treaties. So Japan and or, sorry, um, Norway and Iceland set their own quotas for numbers of whales that can be taken um, and issue their own permits for whaling. But as far as I know, these are the only three countries that still um, do a significant amount of whaling. Um, and then there's some, some issues. Um, I'll put a couple of links to some videos up on Moodle. Um, Australia and New Zealand are trying to call Japan on their scientific whaling expeditions um, and put a stop to it. Uh, but that's having mixed, mixed success. <laughs> All right. So those are some pretty major, uh, pretty well-known U.S. laws and um, international laws that are used to protect species. There are, of course, many others in the U.S. and internationally that are used as well. All right, so we will um, discuss how well these laws and uh, regulations work in class, so make sure you have read up on them, um, and please read Section 8.4 of your book. All right.